All right, let's get our Bibles out to Hebrew or Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12. So, as I've said before, we don't need to hear from me today. What we do need to hear from is the Lord. So, you know, even when I have a casual conversation, I'm always listening for the voice of the Lord within someone else's voice. And one of the things that we need to always remember, never be picky or choosy about who God brings the word to you through. Because in the Old Testament, he used a donkey. And I mean, how can you imagine that? All of a sudden that, that donkey started speaking and that'll get your attention. But I'm like this when I'm talking because sometimes God has used the most unusual vessels. And all of a sudden, I was sitting there. The first time I ever met Dr. Lester Sumrall, <clears throat> up close and personal, he preached for us in August of 1988. And he had been to this church before. But then Lynn and I became senior pastors in January of 87. And this is where it started for me because he was sitting in my little 10 foot by 10 foot office that if you open the door too fast, the little ceiling panels made a noise like people jumped because it... You'd open it like that, and people were like, what is that? And I, he was sitting in my little desk that was shoved against the wall, and I will never forget this because this was a life-changing event. He looked over at me, and we were having a hot drink, and we were going to go out and eat afterwards, and he said, well, Mark, I'd like you to come to Israel with us in November. or somebody I'd like you to meet there. And uh, he said, I'd like you to meet Pastor Rod Parsley, and uh, we're going to be going in November. And at that time, we were so poor, we could not pay attention here. We had threatening lawsuits. We had, with the third senior pastors, we had creditors. We inherited all that stuff. And so I sat there with a big smile, and I said, well, Dr. Summerall, you know, we would love to do that. We've never been to Israel. We'd love to go, and if, if a way opens up, we'll sure come. And I'm thinking in my mind while I'm saying that, we don't have that kind of money. I can't imagine it was $1,700 a person. And I just thought in my mind, there is no way that will ever happen. Did you know the Lord was speaking to him, speaking to me through him? And my faith was so little and minuscule, I had trouble processing it. And I said, well, if that happened... And it wasn't a month later, one of our members was in his front yard, a businessman that God had sent here, was here on the, and he said, out to this businessman in his front yard, he said, send Mark and Linda to Israel and pay for everything. He told me later, he said, the only question I had was, oh, he said, okay, Lord, but he goes, is it okay if I go too? <laughs> so him and his wife came, and we went over there, and that was a life-changing event because when we got over there, there was a special offering because Dr. Summerall had started Feed the Hungry the year before and had a visitation in Israel. And it was so thick and so strong, he stayed up the whole night and there's a whole story behind that. So we were there and we were just happy to be there. Never been to Israel, have the Bible come alive. That was in 1988. And while we're sitting there, they're doing a special offering. Pastor Rod Parsley was preaching and they were receiving a love offering for Feed the Hungry. And all of a sudden, the businessman that paid for it said, I don't understand this. He whispered to me, they were receiving the offering. He said, I don't understand this. I'm supposed to give $1,000 to the church so the church can give $1,000 to feed the hungry. Well, I'm thinking, that's easy enough. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, I look back, that was a turning point in our life. I had no idea I was going to share this, but it's for somebody. Because sometimes the Lord is speaking to you and you don't even know it. And as I look back on that day when Lester Sumrall looked at me while he was sipping on his hot drink, that there was a word from the Lord, I want you to come to Israel. But my faith was so minuscule and at a deficit, I couldn't even imagine it. And my mind was really thinking, that ain't never going to happen. And God already had it lined up for me. You know, I don't know if you know this or not. I think I just preach myself happy right there. <laughs> I'm getting ministered to. <laughs> the Lord is speaking to me while I'm talking to you. 
And all of a sudden I realized because after that, when we sowed that seed, because the Bible says that he'll give seed to the sower and God is not mocked that whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And through the years I've learned there are believers demanding a harvest where they've never sown any seed. They want a harvest, Lord, bless this and bless that. But the word says, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And so he put a thousand dollars into our, and then all of a sudden this thing started dominoing. A man came up to me afterwards, some weeks after, and he said, uh, I heard we're getting close to getting out of the red ink into the black ink. And he pulls a $10,000 tithe check, tithe check. So you know what that's a tithe of. God started blessing him, and he said, here's a, here, this is going to take care of that. And I didn't know there was that much money in the whole wide world back then. You've got to remember, this is the late 80s, and our total income for the year was $220,000, and here was a $10,000 tie check. You know what the first thing I did? I didn't eat my seed. I went in. There were some missionaries I wanted to support. Some of them were still supporting today. Jim Purr is one of those missionaries. Man, I was, I was so excited. We started writing $300 checks and, and then $350 checks, and then it grew from there. Anyway, I guess the reason I'm sharing this is because many times we're asking the Lord and he's answering, but are we listening? Are we expecting? Because thine expectation shall not be cut off. And so as we get into the word today, let that expectancy rise up in your heart because hindsight's golden. And I look back and I realize there were times I missed God. God told me to do certain things. And I said, well, I don't know how I'm going to do that, Lord. And I didn't follow through on it. And it's not my job to make things happen. It's my job to believe things will happen. And I can follow the Lord step by step and he'll take me the way that I need to go. Go to Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. So what we're talking about today is breaking up the fallow ground. Breaking up the fallow ground. And Hosea chapter 10, verse 12 says, Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. So I've been digging into some of Charles Finney's old revival lectures. Charles Finney lived from 1792 to 1875. He's called the father of the Second Great Awakening. Charles Finney was an amazing individual. He's an attorney, and he got saved. And some of the meetings that they used to have, there was such a strong presence of God that many times he wouldn't even have to open his mouth. The presence of God was so overwhelming. I know one time up in the New England area, they got a schoolhouse and they had the meetings in the evening and the power of God came so strong on the people that people were struck by the conviction of God and would lay prostrate on their face. Conviction of sin would come. And one day it went all night and people would stay with people all night long. And what ended up happening, it was time for school to start the next morning. They had to start carrying people out because the kids needed to get in there and have their class. And he was the one that wrote, and I put these revival lectures, there's a link. You can find most of his stuff online, but they're very convicting. So if you go to our app or our website, there's a link, it'll take you to those. But this is one where he was talking about breaking up the fallow ground. And here's the thing. When Hosea was talking to the Jews, they knew what he was talking about. They were farmers. And that's the way the Lord does it. When he talks to us, he's always relative. He'll talk in a way that we can understand. When Jesus taught, he used parables. What are, what's a parable? It means to lay something parallel alongside of it. It's something you and I can understand. Sometimes I'll use an analogy of a computer. You know, you find out that the software really often can be the issue in the functioning. Any of you ever have software upgrades where it'll say it fixes this bug or that bug? There was nothing wrong with your smartphone or smart tablet or your computer. There was something in the software in the programming, and I'm here to tell you there's nothing wrong with you today. God recreated you in his image, 
and he didn't make junk and he didn't make anything messed up. But sometimes we've got a little software virus or bug and it's called doubt, it's called unbelief, it's called wrong teaching. And Jesus warned us about wrong teaching. He warned, he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And they're thinking, what is he talking about? Is he talking about, you know, the food or the bread or what have you? He said, no, beware of the teaching of the Pharisees. In other words, you and I are his sheep. We can hear his voice. Make sure that you are careful who you sit under because what you sit under will start happening to you if you're not careful. It gets down in your heart. And there are some people that will teach you that cancer is a gift from God. And, and, you know, he gives it to some people to teach them lessons. And, they, they you know, people have been told that, you know, I remember one man that became an atheist, became a Christian later on in life, but he became a hell raiser in his life because his mother died giving birth to him. And he asked his grandmother, why did my mom die? And why does everybody else have a mom? And I've got a grandmother. And she mistakenly told him, because she didn't know better, I guess, that God was lonely in heaven and decided to pluck the little flower, and that was his mother, and he brought her home. Well, listen, that's not what the Word says. The Bible says that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And with long life, he'll satisfy us. And you know what he did? He said, well, if that's the kind of God this is, I don't want anything to do with him. And he became a God-hater and a self-professed atheist and became a hell raiser for his life until somebody shared the gospel with him. So we have to be careful what kind of teaching that we sit under or what kind of teaching. You and I can hear the voice of God. And if there's any area of our life that's not working, I promise you the, the answer is in this book, when the Lord gives us understanding and quickens. But now here's the key. Notice what he says, break up your fallow ground, it is time to seek the Lord. So these Jews, they understood that. They were farmers. So I used to go down to, well, I grew up in West Texas, and then I would go down to my grandparents. And the ground could get so hard that it was just like you could put a big old crowbar and throw it down in it, and it would almost bounce off of it. Fallow ground is ground that has been subjected to the elements. Did you know that our hearts, even as born-again, spirit-filled believers, can get hard if we're not careful? You go through things in life. You get betrayed. Somebody cheats you out of something, lies on you. I'll get, I don't even have to ask. We've all been lied on, betrayed, those that should have protected you betrayed you the most. Some of you grew up in homes that the half's never been told. And if we're not careful, if we take those things in deep, people said things to you. And you know, we have to be careful that we as believers, when we hear other people's stories, we don't just say, well, just get over it. Be careful. You might get a chance to feel what they've been through. You might get a chance to have that same opportunity, but here was what the Lord taught me. I was blessed, I'm so thankful for my mom and dad, they're in heaven now. Grew up in a Lutheran home, it wasn't a spirit-filled home or anything, but I am grateful for that Lutheran church, Missouri Synod, because the word was strong. And then God had a hook in my jaw and watered those seeds later. But when we became senior pastors, that was a whole nother arena. Being the third, and then all of a sudden, things begin to happen that are out of control. People begin to say and do things to really pull you down, shut the church down. You find out people are praying that the church would close. You've got things that you did, you know, and so you can get, you can have those pity parties. I threw several pity parties. And nobody ever showed up, including God. <laughs> but they sure felt good. I was the only one there, but you start pitying yourself and all that kind of stuff. And then the Lord taught me a lesson over time. He said, Mark, it's not what is happening to you that's going to do the damage. It's how you respond to what's happening. 
And then he showed me that the same sunshine that melts butter will harden clay. And then I began to see people that go through things, myself included, that they make decisions along the way of what's been happening. Yes, it may be wrong. Yes, it may be evil. Yes, it may be true. They shouldn't have done that. They're supposed to be Christians, but here's the problem. My heart was getting hard. I took offense. And then you start learning what the Bible says about offense. And even Jesus can be offensive. He said, blessed is the one whosoever is not offended in me. Because John the Baptist was offended in Jesus. Is he the one? Are you the one, Lord, we're looking for? Because he was close to his death. His execution was right at the door. And so what we find is that's how your heart gets hard. And the ground gets fallow. And we can come in, lift our hands and praise and pray and read our Bibles and get nothing out of it. And it's like this, the seed is the word of God and the word of God is the seed. But if the ground is fallow and hard and not soft, that'll bounce off just like going out here to the parking lot and throwing seed onto the asphalt. And that's why nothing works. So we have to begin to break up the fallow ground. Now, this is a little bit different from the other services, but I brought in, because in those lectures, Charles Finney just started listing some things, and I came under conviction on some of these, so strong. But he said, here's some things that you have to do. You have to do an inventory of your own heart. And he said, we need to go carefully into our heart just like a businessman goes over his books, looks at the books, and he says there's sins of omission, things we should be doing that we don't do, but then there's sins of commission. Those are things we do we really shouldn't do. And there's a ditch on either side. You can get in trouble doing things you shouldn't do, but you can also get in trouble doing not doing things you should do. So here's some that he lists that we have to inventory. Number one, ingratitude, thanklessness. The Bible says, be ye thankful. Sometimes our, we can just, well, you just don't know what I've been through and this, that, and the other, and it just couldn't get any worse. I beg to differ on that. Things could be worse. When you find yourself in the pit, I can tell you the fastest way out of the pit is to praise him. And last week, I think we read it, that Paul and Silas at midnight prayed, sang praises unto God, even after they'd been beaten, backs opened up, thrown into maximum security. The disciples in the early church said they went away rejoicing. They were counted worthy to suffer after they were severely beaten. And they were thankful, rejoicing. All I can say is, what's my excuse? I have none. We can thank God in all things. Doesn't mean you necessarily thank him for all things. Ingratitude. Number two, lack of love for God. We read this morning in first service that Jesus spoke to Ephesus. He said, you're working hard, you're not growing weary, you've tried those that said they're apostles and are not, found them to be liars. And then the Lord went on and said, and you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which thing I also hate, and that is very simply political correctness. Any of you ever see stuff going on TV and it makes you mad? And did you know Nicolaitan, that name means the destruction of the people? But the word tells us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and our strength. And you know what we find happening in America today? We don't have any room for God anymore. We can't even fit in going to worship with the people of God because when it's nice out, we got to take the boat out. We got to go do this. We got to do that. And God wants you to have recreation. You need, he commanded us to take a day of rest but not a vacation from him. We love the Lord our God with all our heart. 
In Ephesus, he said, this is where you're in trouble with me. You've left your first love. Doesn't mean you don't love God, but is he your first love? Linda's not here right now, but I told her when we first were dating and all that, and oh my God, I mean, open the every door for her, the car door, the restaurant door. There was a little place, some of you may be old enough to remember, Sherry's over on Academy. They'd give those big pieces of pie, big pieces. I was younger. I could get away with eating that kind of food. And, and we would go and stay till 1 in the morning, 2 in the morning. It's like, don't you have to go to work? Oh, don't you worry about it. It's okay. <laughs> then you get married. Then the honeymoon's over. It's like, I need to go to, oh, I need to go to bed. And then it's like, honey, you can open my door. And I'm like, well, is your shoulder hurting or what's the deal? I mean, what's a problem there? And then if I do open the door, she's like, did you see somebody from the church? Are they watching us right now? <laughs> Honeymoon's over. Do we love the Lord like we do when we first fell in love with him? And he said, repent of losing your first love or I'm taking your candlestick. Your, your lampstand's going. Wow. Third thing, neglect of the Bible. If we really loved him, we would love his word. And if we loved him dearly, we would be in his word, not as a, you know, an anesthetic or, you know, a have to. We'd be there because it's his word. And it costs people their lives to get it into our hands. Number four, unbelief. Is unbelief taking hold? Oh, that one hit me. Unbelief. Lack of prayer. Or do we just kind of utter something real quick before we doze off? Neglect of fellowship. If we really love the Lord, we're going to love one another because he said, that's my, can it's my command. It's not a suggestion, but I command you to love one another. And then he took it a level like, you've got to be serious, Lord. He said, love one another like I love you. Spiritual duties. Lack of love for souls. Whew. Do we really stop and think about the people we work with? Some of which are awesome people, good people. Some may, may not be so great a people, but God so loves them that he died for them. Have we stopped and thought, where will they spend eternity? And how many of you, I know all of us have, come into work and somebody's not there because they died or they were killed in a car wreck or something tragic and the chance to witness to them is over. Neglect of family duties. Lack of watchfulness over your witness. Neglect to watch over your brethren. Neglect of self-denial. Loss of things or I'm sorry, love of things and possessions, and we could go on. Oh, my gosh. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up our fallow ground. Let me just start to close with this. Finney said this, revival is no more a miracle than a crop of wheat, and it's a pretty simple but profound statement. And here's what he came against. People thought, and still today, that revival is something God does when he sees he's ready for it. That when he sees fit, he's just going to visit us with power and anointing, and people are going to run into the kingdom, and that's not it at all. What Finney says is revival is no more a miracle than a crop of wheat. So a farmer knows that to get that first batch of seed in the ground, what does he have to do? He has to break up the fallow ground. You can't put seed in the ground till it's toiled. And here's what we're saying. Hosea is saying, break up the fallow ground of your heart. I don't know about you, the last few months since all this corona stuff and things changed so much, there was a time of reflection and I started coming under real strong conviction. And it was a time of repentance. I told the story, remember the daytimers when they used to just have the hard copies before the smartphones and I would order a year at a time. And so one day I looked and I found my plastic box that had a whole year 
and this was the late 80s or the early 90s, and I thought, good Lord, need to throw that thing away. Because, you know, you'd keep them in case you had stuff you had to retrieve a year or two. I opened up, and I just started going through the pages and looked at what was on my calendar, and this is what hit me. I wasted so much time. I was busy, but I looked and I go, a lot of what was on there was not important. And then just think about standing before the Lord and he opens up our lives. And there on a screen is a digital day timer of how we spent our life. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the people that God may have sent to our path? And he said, I brought them to you so you could witness to them. But you were too busy. And then to look and see they were in hell now. Charles Finney said millions and millions and millions are in hell because Christians think God just sends revival when he sees fit. And he said, it's really no more of a miracle than a crop of wheat. There's certain things we must do, and if we'll do it, if we'll do it, but it starts with the rending of our hearts, not our garments, getting our, our heart broken back up, fallow ground, broken up, to quit the pointing of the finger, what is everybody else doing that's wrong needs to be, if they just listen to me or if they just do this, it wouldn't be, or if they'd quit doing that or that. And you know what? When I would go through that, even in these last several months, you know where it always landed? Right here. There's a non-Christian that said this. We need to become the change that we desire to see. Be the change. We have so much power. So, in these next coming months, I don't know what it is, but September and October, there's some intensity coming. Spiritually. Church needs to be praying. I shared it in the first two services, but Bob Jones, he was the one, this old guy that never really had a preaching ministry, he'd just see stuff. 10 years ago, he, he, he shot a video, 10, no, 2010, I'm sorry. He died in 2014, and it was like it was for today. It was like he shot the video this morning. And he said, there's coming the perfect storm to America. It's an intense one. And he said he saw seven storms within that perfect storm. Listen to what he says, because you'd think he made the tape this morning. He said, there is coming a storm to government of the likes have never been seen before. He said, there will be upheaval in the government. He said, there's coming a storm in the government of the church such as never been seen before. He said, there's going to be an upheaval with it. And he said, there's going to be gum Holy Spirit governance. He said, there will be emotional storms. He said, people just losing it. He actually made this statement. He said, there's going to be psychiatrists and psychologists that need Christians to deliver them and minister to them. Because your knowledge can only take you so far. When you're in a spiritual battle, your degrees and in intellect won't get you there. The energy of the flesh will never overcome the power of the spirit. Political disturbances, governance, uh, I'm sorry, economic disturbances. And then he said this one thing. He said, I was in a meeting, uh, some of you know M Morningstar, he was connected there. He said, I was in a meeting in North Carolina. And he said, all this influenza was killing all these people. Y'all remember when that happened back then? That influ I mean, children were dying, babies were dying. It was hitting Colorado Springs. It was a very contagious flu, influenza. And he said, all these preachers were together at this conference. And he said, the Lord spoke to me. He said, he was angry with these preachers because they had power and authority over the storms and they were not taking authority and exercising it. He says, I gave them authority. I give believers authority to take authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt. 
Philip, in Acts chapter 8, went down to Samaria and preached Christ. And what happened? It says there was great joy in that city. You know what I want? I want great joy for the city of Colorado Springs. We all do. There are pastors that want it right here, and there's a group coming together. But not every city's got great joy. Portland doesn't have great joy. They got a lot of dead bodies right now. They got a lot of burned neighborhoods. And, and there's cities all over. And it's interesting, the cities that have been burning, the cities where the murder of the innocent, I am telling you, innocent people being murdered. Do you know where that's happening? Where they push God out. God is not welcome there. That's why the devil said through certain governors and mayor, church, you can't meet, you can't sing, you can't have home study groups. The devil wants us to shut up. He doesn't want us singing. He doesn't want us praising. He doesn't want us praying. He doesn't want us doing any of those things. But we can change. We can drive these storms out. There's authority. You don't have to wait to get authority. You and I have it right now. We have authority right now. We can stop these storms. Cities can have great joy. And the last thing I'll say, he said, I see such a strong anointing for home groups. You got to hear this. I've never heard it said this way. He said, there's a strong anointing for home groups. He said, this will be the time of harvest. And he said, I saw people becoming barns. An individual person would be a barn. He says, when you harvest something, what do you do? You have to have a barn to take it in. When these, these people get born again, they need to be discipled. They need to be helped. They need someone that can guide them. And he said, I saw this. He said, I saw people that could handle 10 people. Well, some of you work at a job where you supervise hundreds of people. You're responsible to them. They look to you. Think about it spiritually, how important. Some could handle 10. Some could handle 100. Some could even handle 1,000. And individual people would be barns that people could, the Lord could bring them in. And I'm telling you, this last harvest, this end time harvest, we're not going to get the world into the church. We've got to get the church out into the world. You're the harvesters. Jesus said, the harvest is so plentiful. He said that 2,000 years ago. And he said, so pray. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will thrust people out into the fields of harvest. This is the time. We got to pray, though. Something's up for September and October. So here's what I believe as we close. Hell has some things planned that is no way, shape, or form. If hell's planning it, we know. No way, shape, or form. It is not the will of God. The most dangerous thing we could do is sit back and say, well, you know, it did say it'll get dark in the last days and evil will wax more evil. No, no, no. We have authority over the hell that is trying to be unleashed right now. So there are things leading up to this election, because this is a spiritual battle, that we've got to take authority over. Tuesday morning, we'll be praying 7 a.m., 845, we have the government prayer altar. You can either come then. Uh, it's, a, it's based on the model Bishop Joshua Lawery uses in Uganda. It's how the believers took back Uganda from genocide, from wicked people that were in authority. And so I know many of you are praying individually, but how many of you know it's good to pray together? And so we come in and we just let the Holy Ghost flow on Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. If you can't come here or Southwest, just log in because a lot of people do that while they're driving to work. So we need to be praying. There's some very wicked things that want to unleash in September and October and we can stop it. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up before you our nation. Lord, we know it's harvest time. And Father, you are sending laborers into the harvest, and we're a part of that. Many are being awakened. A new authority is coming up in the body of Christ. We ask in the name of Jesus, Father, for a quickening of the Holy Spirit. Help us in breaking up fallow ground. Let our hearts get tenderized once again, Lord, like it's never been before. Thank you for the gifts of the Holy Ghost, Father. 
that are within each of us and working in this body. Thank you for the intercessors that are so faithful to pray. Thank you, Lord, for home groups that are being birthed. You, Lord, even speaking this service right now to people that need to start home groups. We thank you that, Lord, you're talking to them and have talked to them, and we just speak obedience into their life in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, you are faithful, and we do not succumb to the spirit of fear. You haven't given us a spirit of fear, but that of love, power, and a sound mind, a disciplined mind. And I thank you, Lord, we rise up in your power and we trample and tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. We pray over our president and vice president, all governing authorities, our Supreme Court justices, and we bind demon spirits from attacking them. We bind evil spirits from speaking to them. Lord, we thank you for our city, Colorado Springs, and we thank you for the state of Colorado. Lord, we just pray right now the church rise up, take authority over these storms of evil and violence and wickedness and upheaval. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for pastors, Lord. Have the fire of God to rise within them and speak like men and women from another world. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We do have authority over the storms and we walk in that authority, and we give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. And if there's anyone that's not 100% sure that you are born again online or here, listen to me. Death never gives you the warning that it's coming. It comes at an unexpected time, if at all possible. And you need to be ready now. And if you're not 100% sure, online or here, and you're ready to give your life to the Lord and come into the kingdom, let me know by lifting your hand up high so we can pray with you. I just think of how many people that said, well, I'll just put it off till tomorrow, and tomorrow never came. Anybody, lift your hand up here in the auditorium or online if you'd let us know. Five people got saved last service. That's five peoples whose whole, whole lives changed. We will never know the destruction that is averted. And we don't want to know. We just know this. There's safety when you come to the Lord. Eternal safety. Anybody lift your hand up anywhere online? And Father, I just pray out beyond that tomorrow when, when people go back to work or they're intermingling with family, Lord, help us have our fallow ground broken up in our heart to be sensitive to those that are not saved. And Lord, be willing to speak. Give us boldness, Father God, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that there's a sensitivity, a quickening, Lord, concerning prayer for the month of September and October, that, Lord, we shut down the gates of hell, that we crush that enemy under our feet, and that everything the devil meant for evil, Lord, that it will turn and work for our good. We decree and declare we are one nation under God. We remain one nation under God. We'll always be one nation under God so long as the body of Christ is in this earth, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody shouted amen. amen. Let's give the Lord a praise today. Hallelujah.